First John chapter 5 verse 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We could say it like this. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Or we could read it like this. Our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. I think another way you could say it would be like this. Our faith overcomes. Amen. Our faith overcomes. And I like to personalize that and say it like this. My faith overcomes. Everybody in here say, my faith, my faith overcomes. overcomes. Say, my faith, my faith overcomes. overcomes. Say yes. yes. My, faith my faith overcomes. Overcome. Are you glad your faith will overcome? Amen. Praise the Lord. We talked a few weeks here. We actually started a, uh, a short series entitled Victory's Greatest Enemies. And uh, in that we talked about the first great enemy of our uh, victory being condemnation. How many are glad you are not walking under the cloud of condemnation? If you are under the cloud of condemnation, condemnation is robbing you of your victory. And that's not the plan of God. Well, today I want to talk about the second great enemy of our victory. And this one would be faithlessness. Everybody say faithlessness. Well, what is faithlessness? That is the opposite of faithfulness, faithfulness, being full of faith, full of courage, full of the strength of faith. But there's a whole lot of people who are not full of faith. They are walking in this thing of faithlessness. And therefore, they are being robbed of our being robbed of our victory in many, many areas because their faith is less than what it needs to be. Uh, there's a couple of passages, we won't look at these this morning, but there's a couple that speaks of this. For instance, uh, Jesus uh, said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When he returns the second time, when he comes, is he going to find faith? Well, that tells me that when Jesus comes, he's going to be looking primarily for faith. Are you going to give him any faith when he shows up? I plan to, amen. There's other places where Jesus spoke and he said to different ones, oh, ye of little faith. And usually, well, I think in every instance, it was in rebuke because faith was not what it was supposed to be. So he would say, oh, ye of little faith. How many knows when Jesus speaks about Grace Fellowship, we don't want Jesus to say, oh, Grace Fellowship, ye of little faith. Amen. There were other times that uh, Jesus said, uh, particularly, how is it that you have no faith? For instance, when the disciples were out in the boat and Jesus was asleep and a storm came up. And uh, they ran down and woke him up and said, do you not care that we perish? And actually what they were saying, Jesus, you, don't re- you must not care anything about us to let us die. We're going to die out here in this storm. And Jesus woke up and he said, how is it that you have no faith? Well, they had just watched him feed the multitudes from a few loaves and a few fish. They had saw him do great and powerful miracles. And yet now they're convinced the same Jesus that had healed the sick, same Jesus that had raised the dead, same Jesus that had fed the multitudes was going to allow them to perish out there in the Sea of Galilee during a storm. And, and Jesus said, how in the world is it that you have no faith? So how many can see that in Scripture, faith is extremely important? And we could say this this morning, faith is extremely important regarding your victory. We could say, no faith, no victory. You're not going to have very much victory if you don't have any faith. So that would say to us that we need to rise up and build our faith. Turn around and tell somebody this morning, you need to build your faith. Amen. Let's go back to our text this morning. And this verse 4 in chapter 5 of 1 John says, Whatsoever is born of God 
whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Now, can we just say right here, every person that is saved, you are born of God. Amen. How many knows that we found out you got to be born again to be saved? Amen. And so if you are born again, you are born of God. In fact, the first verse of this fifth chapter says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Well, when you got saved, you put your faith in the Christ. You put your faith in Jesus to do the saving. You stopped working to save yourself. Thank God, because you could never work it out anyway. And you put your faith in Christ. So when you put your faith in Christ, when you got saved, you were born again or you were born of God. Then our text says, whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. So because you are a born again person, born of God, it is now residing in you to overcome whatever comes your way. Ladies and gentlemen, there is overcoming power dwelling and living on the inside of me and everyone who is born of God. Sometimes the church gets into this thing, well, I just don't think I'll ever make it. You're not overcoming. Somebody said, well, I just don't think we can ever get out of this. You're not overcoming. Somebody said, I just don't think I can ever rise above these circumstances. You're not overcoming. But I'm here to tell you, if you are born of God, the ability to overcome is living yeah. down on the inside of you. Jesus has made it possible. The blood has made it possible. The angels are making it possible. The Holy Ghost is making it possible. The only one that's standing in the way is you and the devil, and the devil isn't a problem because Jesus already dealt with him. So it's time for you to deal with you so you can overcome. Whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So no matter what has happened, no matter what is happening, no matter what will happen, overcoming power is in me. Amen. Say this right now. Say, overcoming power Amen. is living in me. Amen. Now, overcoming is a victory term. We're talking about the enemies of our victory. So we could be talking about enemies of overcoming. The first great thing you've got to do to overcome is get a mindset that you are able to overcome. Amen. And you've got to stop talking defeat and start, start talking some victory. You've got to start talking like a victor. You've got to start believing like a victor. And believers are, uh, victors are convinced they can overcome. They can make it. They can succeed. They can come out. They can come through. No matter what is happening in my life right now, I plan as a victor to get out of that, come through that, overcome that, and win this battle. Doesn't matter how fierce the battle, I plan to win because this is the victory that overcomes yeah. my faith, and I've got the faith that says I can win. Yeah. All right. So, faith is a key here. Now, I just want to throw some things at you. You grab these real fast uh, about faith because it is important. Look at somebody and say, faith is important. I, I feel led to say this right here because some folks would say, uh, our pastor preaches too much faith. I had, a, I had a person in one of my churches one time not this church, that met with me and said, Preacher, you're preaching too much faith. Well, can you get too much faith? Is faith important? Is it the victory that overcomes the world? Then if you're going to overcome, you got to have some faith and you better find a preacher that will preach some faith. By the way, that guy's marriage failed, his home failed, everything about him collapsed. I think he needed some faith because he didn't overcome. So let me throw these two. Faith overcomes. We saw that. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 tells us something about faith. It says we walk by faith, not by sight. 
Now leave that up there just a moment. Because that word walk means it is a manner of life. It is a manner of life. This is going to be extremely important when I wind this sermon up here in just a few minutes. That faith is a walk. It is a lifestyle. It is not a fad. It is not hype. Some want to talk about hyper faith. I don't see no, any such thing as hyper faith. It is not the next phase of some fad that is passing through the church. No, we walk by faith, meaning faith has now become my lifestyle. I'm walking by faith on Sunday. I'm walking by faith on Monday. I'm walking by faith Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm walking by faith. It is my manner of life. We could also say it like this. It is my manner of life when everything is going well and it is my manner of life when everything has gone haywire. It is my manner of life when everything in my life is working out for good or when it is not. Faith is now my manner of life. I'm living by faith and not what I see in the natural. All right? Then Romans 5 Verse 1, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse tells us that if we are going to be justified, there is only one means of this justification, and that is you will be justified in the presence of a holy and righteous God by faith. Everybody say justified by faith. Go on to the next verse, please. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now here we have access by faith. Somebody said, I just want to get to God. Honey, right here is how you do it. In fact, I want to say that it is the only way you can ever access God if you walk into the presence of God by any other means. The presence of God will probably slay you in an instance. That's why you've got to put faith in Christ and through faith in Christ, now you access grace so that you can walk right into the presence of God. So we have found out already how important this thing is. Faith brings our victory. It is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is our hope. Faith is our access. Faith is our justification. And by faith we walk. It is our manner of life. Turn around and tell somebody, I'm finding out this faith is important. All right. Now, if faith is this important, then we would ask the question, what is faith? And since we're talking about victory and we're talking about overcoming, I want to ask this question this way. What is overcoming faith? Well, most of you would say, look over at Hebrews 11, verse 1, and the Word of God tells you what this overcoming faith is. Can you put that up there for me, please? Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Now what this actually uh, has to do with here is that faith is the substance or it puts together, it is the stuff that puts together what I am believing for. Faith becomes my evidence of what I don't see yet. Are you here? Say amen. Now somebody said this and I thought it was really good. Hope is my blueprint, but faith is the cement and the bricks, the mortar that puts it all together. Because you can have a blueprint. A blueprint gives you an image of what you desire. We had a blueprint of this building. You remember that, Dickie? We had a blueprint that showed us what we were going to do in this facility, in every part of this facility. But I want to tell you, we didn't enjoy the blueprint too much. 
because you couldn't sit in the blueprint. You couldn't worship in the blueprint. In fact, this, I look back at the pictures of the condition this building was in, and now I look at it and I think, wow, we've come so far. Amen. But we needed some brick and mortars, we, mortar we would say. We needed some sheetrock. We needed some stuff on the floor. We needed some carpet. We needed some of these metal studs that hold these walls together. We needed some wiring for the lights. Dickie here did our lighting in here. Aren't you glad to see Dickie and Wanda here today? <laughs> Praise the Lord. All the way from Louisville, Kentucky. But we needed all these pieces. See, our blueprint was the hope of what we were going to build, but when we started needing to put it together, we needed the pieces. Faith becomes the pieces that puts the puzzle together. So I may not have my healing yet in the natural. I may have a blueprint. I'm looking at the blueprint that says, with his stripes I am healed. But my faith is the substance that brings it together and it produces the healing in my body. So one day I'm moving from blueprint to manifestation of healing in my body. Amen. 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 Another great verse, talking about faith. It, it's, uh, Hebrews eleven six says, it's impossible to please God without faith. So if you're going to please God, you must have faith. Everybody shout faith. faith. So we're finding out we're justified by it. We have access by it. By, it's our victory that overcomes the world. It's by faith. We're finding out that it is our manner of life. We walk by faith and not by sight. We found out that it is my evidence of what I can't see yet. And now we have found out that this faith is pleasing to God. So if we're going to please God, be a church to please God, we've got to be a church of faith. If you're going to be an individual that's going to please God, you're going to have to be an individual of faith. But here's the thing. Most of what we see in these scriptures, and especially what we saw there in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's really telling us what faith does. For instance, that scripture there we read, faith walks by, uh, we walk by faith and not by sight, really reveals what faith does or how faith acts. So does it answer the question of what faith is? Well, look at another verse here. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Romans 3, verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, no but by the law of faith. By the law of faith. Everybody look at me and say, the law of faith. So if we don't get anything else out of this message this morning, what I want you to understand, when we ask the question, what is faith since faith is so powerful? Since by faith we overcome, by faith we have access, by faith we're justified, by faith we please God, by faith we have our manner of life. Since faith is all of these things, we need to remember faith is a law. Everybody say the law of faith. The law of faith. Now this is why this is so significant. Because you can live by law or you can try to live by theory. And our world is a world of theories. You get a lot of theories from the news media. You get a lot of theories from your universities. You don't even have to go into the university and the educational system to get a lot of theories because man's theories have flooded our educational institutions. But theories do come and go. Theories do change. Are you here? Say amen. amen. 
So what is a theory today, because culture will be different 25 years down the road, the theories that are being taught today in the educational classroom may no longer be taught or definitely will be tweaked and changed 25 years down the road. Just like some of the theories that you and I grew up with in the classroom are no longer being taught or they have changed drastically because theories are based on an opinion and opinions can change. But laws do not change. For instance, the law of gravity has been in operation since God created it. Somebody said, when did he create it? I don't know. Maybe when he created the heavens and the earth in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and God saw fit to put gravity on this planet. And so every person ever born on this earth experiences gravity and you never get up in the morning wondering or questioning, will gravity fail today? Will it fail us today? Will we all of a sudden lose gravity? I'm going to tell you, ever since I came into this service this morning, I have not been fearful that I'm going to lose gravity and I'm going to float up to the ceiling. Not worried about that. Because gravity is a law, it is consistent, it has never changed, it is never changing, it will not change. Now one of these days, the rapture of the church is going to take place and some of us, the gravity that holds things to this world will no longer work against us any longer. We will lose gravity. Or better say, gravity will lose us. But it's a law. Shout, it's a law. law. And the law is unchanging. And we find out that faith is a law. The other thing we find out about laws is this. We don't worry from one moment or next about them. We just function in them. I didn't get up this morning and try to figure, is gravity working or not? Uh, You know, no, because it's just a way of life for me. Faith is a law. And that means it is supposed to become a way of life for you so that you believe by faith, you speak by faith, you act by faith, you live by faith. Everything you do is through this thing of faith. And there is a point you get to, you don't even have to think about it and say, is my faith working today? No, because you've come to a place where faith is now a manner of life for you and you just respond to the day-to-day circumstances by faith because that's what you do as a child of God. Shout, it's a law. So we found our faith now, this faith that overcomes, this faith that pleases God, this faith that gives us access, this faith that causes us to win and not lose. This faith that justifies us, this faith is a law that's never changing, and that's good. Can you shout, that's good? good. Now let's look at something else. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Start with verse 13. We having... The same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I have believed, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Now I want to catch a couple of things here. The first thing he says, we all having the same spirit of faith. Well, who are we all? We all having the same spirit of faith. We having the same. Who are the we? It is we. Us. Born again. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. We. Us. I. You. I. It is us. So we have the same spirit of faith. Everybody look up here. It's born again. Say this. Say, I have a spirit of faith. 
Now there's another verse that says, He has dealt to every man a measure of faith. Every, to everyone is born, it, it is dealt a measure of faith. I'm going to give you an awakening here this morning. Some of you are going to have to ponder this. Some of you might not even like it. Don't ask me if I care. <laughs> There's a point in your age you get to, you just don't care so much anymore. All right? You have been given a measure of faith, we having the same spirit of faith, the we is every born again person. And so I hear people often say, Pastor, pray for me, I just need more faith. No, you don't. I'm going to make a strong statement. you got all the faith you're ever going to get. See, some of you are afraid to amen that. You're going to amen it by faith, aren't you? <laughs> you got all the faith you need. God gave you all the faith you're ever going to need. Here's the problem. You need to develop it. Now you can amen it. Because undeveloped faith will not do a thing for you. Won't heal you. Undeveloped faith will not produce miracles. Now you can come to a no faith status if you don't develop it. Alright, let me put it this way. Maybe this will make more sense. If you, sometimes people that uh, start working out at the gym, don't you love those folk? Amen. Amen. And after about three or four or five months, you see them. Now we post the pictures on Facebook. And we see the before, the before and the after, and some of them are drastic. Would you say amen? amen? A change has taken place. Now I'm going to be honest with you. Don't you love those who put the before and after, and from your eye you're saying, I don't see any change, it's the same. But in their mind, they've had a change. <laughs> and sometimes they'll say Pastor I started working out I got new muscles No you don't You don't have no new muscles You have the same muscles you had The difference is you begin to develop Those muscles And once they were developed by pumping iron Lifting weights and doing all the other stuff You do at the gym Y'all have to tell me about it When you go do all that stuff The same muscles that before didn't look like too much All of a sudden become much Because now you are developing What you already had Ladies and gentlemen you got enough faith to win every battle You got enough faith on the inside of you To overcome every devil You got enough faith to get healed of any disease You got enough faith to make it through any battle But you got to take time To develop your faith If you don't develop it It'll never work for you Come on give God praise So faith is a law and this word says we all have this spirit of faith working in us. We're going to close this with something interesting. Go back to the verse, verse 13 there, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Let's focus on that just a minute, get it in our spirit. As it is written, I believed, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Say it like this right now. Let me hear you say, say I believe, I believe. therefore have I spoken. Therefore have I spoken. We, believe. we believe, therefore, therefore. we speak. Is believing important? Yes. Is speaking important? Yes. See, we're convinced, pretty much convinced believing is important. You ask most church members and they'll agree, believing is extremely important. But as soon as you mention speaking, 
Well, that's just the old name and claim it, blab it, grab it, <laughs> message. I want to just say to you, people have been naming it and claiming it and blabbing it and grabbing it for years. Y'all didn't come for this, but you, we're not charging you a dime, all right? <laughs> Free. Every family reunion, some of you have been grabbing the heart disease that your family has had for the last hundred years that you know of. Some of you have been blabbing and grabbing the addiction. Some of you have blabbed and grabbed alcoholism. Some of you have named and claimed depression because depression runs in our family. So I've got to have it. I better find out what medication you're on because I'm sure going to need it. Ladies and gentlemen, you are blabbing and grabbing, naming and claiming, but it's time for you to turn the naming and claiming around to believe and speak according to 2 Corinthians 4, 13. See, here's why the, there's never an issue with naming it and claiming it. As long as it meets this criteria. It must be negative. Glory. I mean, you gather around the Christmas dinner table. And Aunt Sally's got to tell you all her ailments. And what do you say? Well, let me tell you about my ailments. Let me tell you what my doctor said. What medications are you on, honey? And now we have that question that is so prevalent. How's your health? Well, glory to God, I'm healed. That'll shut up the conversation quickly. <laughs> that will shut down talk and you will be labeled a fanatic, a religious idiot. But if you'll join in and start naming your ailments and naming your pains and naming where you have arthritis and naming where your gout is and naming your uh, uh, inability to remember like you used to. I mean, we have filled the Christmas dinner table with these conversations, naming it and claiming it, but you let one person dare rise up and name healing or name the blessing or name the provision of the cross other than salvation from hell. Let one person name the benefits in in the will, in the covenant, and you are a fanatic. Well, I've named my salvation and I have claimed it. I have named my healing and I have claimed it. I have named my prosperity and I have claimed it. I don't care. You just go ahead and keep what you got. But I'm going to name what the word of God said. I have believed, therefore I speak. This is faith. And this is the faith the spirit of faith that overcomes. Shout amen. amen. This is the spirit of faith that overcomes. Two components, believing and speaking. I have believed, therefore I speak. Well, I will speak when I see it. No, 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 no. I believe, I speak when I believe it. Y'all see that? Is that Bible? If you go by the other side, remember we walk by faith, not by sight. You could never have confessed your salvation. Believe and confess your salvation. We have no problem with that. But you haven't seen the streets of gold. You haven't touched the nail-pierced hands of Jesus. You have not saw the mansions. You confess Jesus by faith, not by sight. You believed in him and you confessed him with your mouth. And by believing in your heart and confession with your mouth, Romans says that's how you got saved. Amen. Can I just give you a news flash? That's how you get healed. Amen. That's how you get delivered. That's how you get victorious. That's how you overcome. 
Some may say, well, I just never was taught that. Honey, that's your problem. We come to teach you what the Word says, not what tradition says. Tradition will keep you in sickness, disease, poverty, and blindness. But we have come to declare that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, meaning he'll do whatever needs to be done in your life. But faith is the key that unlocks the door. It is the key to overcoming, and you better get a hold of it. Well, you already have it, but you better develop it. With that being said, I'll, I'll just, just share briefly. I uh, went through this battle with leukemia. And I've shared many times, but somebody might be here who wasn't here. When I shared, I got up one night, middle of the night, I had to get up quite often during the night, during those days of that battle. And I got up one night, and this scripture, I had no clue where it was, but this scripture was on my heart. I believe, there, this is the way it was in my spirit. I believe, therefore I speak. That's about three in the morning. I'm half away, getting up to go to the restroom, and this is in my spirit. I believe, therefore I speak. I, and then I looked it up. I, I have believed, therefore have I spoken, and also we believe, and therefore we speak. And this is where I have lost my mind. <laughs> All right. Somebody shout a lot by the night. Come on. Check. All right, make sure it's in the recording because the devil doesn't want somebody to hear this, all right? I believe, therefore, I speak. I got up, I'm going to the bathroom, I'm half asleep. I say, I believe, therefore, I speak. I believe, therefore, I speak. I, what do I believe and what am I speaking? I believe by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. Therefore, I am. Therefore, I am healed. My body's not saying it. My body's not agreeing with it. Symptoms are not aligned to say anything different. My lungs are in terrible shape. I've been speaking over them. I've been speaking over them. I have a new set of lungs. My lungs are clear. Every night going to sleep, I would say, I have clear lungs. My lungs are clear. No diseases. Do, do my lungs sound clear right now? Do I have my voice back right now? I got it. That last Memorial Day, we canceled our picnic, but I couldn't have went anyway. I was in such a shape. But honey, I'm in good. I'm in real good shape right now. I don't run anybody in this building. Hallelujah! You see, you gotta believe and you gotta speak. Speak what you believe in. But you better be believing right. But you better get you speaking right because this is the victory that overcomes. One other thing I did. I didn't even know why I did it. When I did it, well, I knew why I did it. But looking back now, I realize there was power release. When I called the bishop of the state of Kentucky for the church of God, great man, he, since he came into this state, no bad reflection on him, but since he got here, we had more preachers dying than ever. <laughs> In fact, I got, we had preachers of all ages dying. Sad. And uh, so when I called him, I said, Bishop, this is my condition. I've been diagnosed with. Now notice I didn't say I've got Somebody said, well, I don't make no difference. Maybe not to you, but I have never said I have leukemia. And in fact, when I would go to a doctor and they would say, you've got leukemia, if I had to respond to that, I would say, I have been, yes, I have been diagnosed with this. I'll plan on, I didn't plan on keeping it. See, I, well, that wasn't mine. 
If it's mine, I'm, it's my possession. I'm going to keep it. But I didn't plan on keeping because it, it didn't belong to me. I know who it belonged to. Amen. It didn't come from God either. I said, Bishop, this is what I've been diagnosed with. I've been diagnosed with CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Things have gone, turned for the worst. Uh, I'm, I'm in trouble. I began to tell him what was going on. And I said, I just want you to know you will not bury Dale Campbell. Amen. <laughs> and he said, amen. Now, some folks would have said that's presumptuous. Others would have said, that's arrogant. Because sometimes faith people are referred to as being arrogant, presumptuous. But what I was doing was releasing a statement based on what I believe. I had believed and therefore now I have spoken that Bishop Bruce Raymond would not bury Dale Campbell. Faith speaking. Are you hearing? We don't have time to go into it. Maybe we'll go into it next week. But Mark eleven twenty three. 23, this is what it's talking about. For whosoever shall say unto the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things whatsoever he saith shall come to pass. Faith develops confidence in what is being said. Amen. Amen. And faith never says, well, I just don't believe my words are important. Amen. Faith develops confidence in what you say. Because James says that those words are like the bridle in the horse's mouth. And he compares it to your life, the direction you're going. The Old Testament death and life are in the power of the tongue. Amen. Did you get anything out of this Amen. today? Stand. Give the Lord praise. Amen. Somebody said, well, I just don't know. Uh, let me give you one verse while they're coming. Psalm 118, verse 17. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Amen. I shall not die. I shall live. I don't know how many times I've said that one. And declare the works of the Lord. Shall I shall not die. I shall, die. I shall, live. I shall live. And declare, and declare the, works the works of the Lord. Somebody said, well, someday we're all going to die. Well, you need to believe for fullness of age. Fullness of life. And then the Bible said, this is a covenant promise, I will satisfy you with long life. Satisfy. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Bow your heads this morning. Thank you, Father. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never received Christ as your Savior. We don't want to leave without giving you an opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus. This is the first base of faith. First base toward victory of many great levels and phases that God's going to take you into that you have to make up your mind to receive the Lord Jesus. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your personal Savior, would you slip your hand up between you, me, and the Holy Spirit and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ in my life. If that's you, would you slip your hand up today anywhere? I don't see any hands. But let's pray this prayer together. Maybe there's some that will watch this video that need to receive Christ. Let's pray it like this. Say, oh God, oh God. we come before you through Jesus, our one and only Savior. And today we're receiving him. 
declaring him to be our salvation. Through his name, we're justified. Through his name, through his blood, we have access. And this day, I receive you, Jesus, as my personal Savior. Amen.